So, Min, I think the the key topic and that we've got within these series is about what's happening related to sort of COVID, what's happening relates to the business sort of side of things. And, and for the benefit of those who, who aren't living in China, you know, you've been mm-hmm. through now, China's been through the first wave of this and things are getting getting back to a new normal. Now, maybe you could just give us a bit of uh, an introduction to what the new normal is like in China in terms of just as a normal citizen traveling around wearing masks, um, you know, temperature checks, the apps you're using and things like that. If you could give us a little bit of an introduction and context of that first, please. Yeah, sure. So, so uh, um, I actually wanted to show you just a, a nice picture of Shanghai to start. Uh, that was taken uh, just uh, uh, a few days ago, there was a beautiful sunset in Shanghai. And uh, yeah, that's literally only, I think, last week in Shanghai. And uh, so uh, pretty much uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned or what I can see, I think Shanghai is uh, quite back to normal. And I feel that uh, the coming out of COVID, it really came in waves. So the startups literally are the first to come back to work because I suppose startups, you can never afford to uh, be uh, not working for very long. So all our portfolio companies uh, came back to work uh, back in February. So CM actually started on February 10, which is like, feels like ages ago already. And all our portfolio companies uh, um, uh, were back to work before end of February. And uh, so uh, in the startup universe, it uh, has been quite, Uh, normal for already two months. Yeah, so I was saying the startups uh, with uh, being always uh, constantly in crisis, right? The startups are the first to come back to work. And uh, for VCs, uh, we pretty much was calling with our portfolio companies during the months of uh, February and March. And then from April, we are meeting uh, startups in office and all visiting them. So by now, it's uh, pretty much back to normal. In, in terms of our business. The discussion we've had on a number of our other calls has been around, you know, as you just touched on here, the, you know, for startups, the cash situation, the changing mm-hmm. customer requirements to moving online or not being able to close big deals because of the, their big multinational customers aren't, you know, have, have been in lockdown longer. What's, what's the current play on, you know, what's the current situation within your portfolio or in, portfolios more generally in terms of cash runway and follow-on investments and things like that. Can you give us a bit of an insight on the um, on that startup market? Yeah, sure. So our portfolio out of our nine companies in China, five of them actually still grew this uh, first quarter compared to the first quarter last year. And uh, none actually have uh, suffering from any cash, uh, uh, cash crunch. Uh, what, several reasons. Most of them raised a, a new round last year, and that really helps. And I was talking to just a bank head just today and asking about what about back, bad loan and so on. So what happens is that even banks see very few default or defaulting risk because a lot of the Chinese businesses, they get their account receivable or big payment at the year end, just before the Chinese New Year. So the time that it happens in the Q, uh, in Q1 uh, in the year is uh, kind of fortunate because for most of the businesses, Q1 was already anyways a uh, low season and uh, they usually get all their cash, big cash payment received in Q4 last year. So that helps to tide over uh, the companies. So our, among the startups that we invest in, the so companies that uh, get impacted the most is uh, companies with export business. Like you said, uh, because currently US and Europe are slowing down and the decisions are not made. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, basically uh, one of our company has majority of their business export to uh, Korea, Japan, and the uh, US and Europe. So that company is impacted because the, basically the customer, um, customer slow down. And then the other type of co- business that get impacted is if they sell to multinational company businesses in China, because a lot of those uh, decisions are still made at multinational headquarters. And because the U.S. and Europe slow down, then the the purchase order slows down from the multinational company China businesses. So, as if the 
startups are mainly addressing the China market, actually we see a very uh, limited impact on the portfolio. So uh, most the businesses are back to normal and uh, there is really a great sense of urgency in China. I think it's uh, uh, difficult to describe, but because the first quarter was called sort of lost for the uh, for many companies, now there's a really great sense of urgency to uh, get it, uh, the lost business back. So we see a tremendous sort of activity in like uh, starting April, uh, and uh, we are busier than ever uh, before. At least I don't see any state aid that uh, is uh, showing up on our startups. Uh, uh, financial. It's like nice to have a little bit of help, uh, some rent rent uh, reduction or some uh, social security payment, but uh, yeah, it's peanut. If you ask any entrepreneurs, they will tell you that the state aid sounds like a lot. The government pushing out a list of policies, but when it actually get executed, it's actually amount to very, very little. So like U.S. style of uh, uh, big loan or bridge loan to the startup and so on. So I think, uh, um, yes, the China market and the U.S. market is uh, quite uh, different at this moment. So all the, uh, currently we are seeing tremendous uh, investment opportunity in the U.S. because the U.S. venture literally stop or freeze. And then there is a, a really funding gap for startups in the U.S. market. First of all, uh, for our fund three, we are actually talking to more Asian investors than ever. So there's a lot more Asian investors from outside of China who are interested in China market and uh, uh, getting uh, to into the China eco ecosystem. Uh, and also because the Asian uh, corporates are under invested in venture. And so the, at this time of crisis, they don't have a big portfolio to have to do bridge financing for. So they actually have more money to deploy. And so it's a great time for them to get into the venture business and deploy capital. Uh, compared to like if you already have a portfolio of 100 companies or 50 that 30 of them need your bridge financing, then you are in trouble, right? So the, mm. we, see, we see Asian investors getting more active. Uh, in the corporate uh, venture space. And we also recently brought on a venture partner who is based in Japan and who is very well connected with the Japanese corporates uh, who are helping our portfolio companies to work with the Japanese, uh, uh, Japan market and Japan corporates. Um, so we are looking, certainly I think uh, it will be uh, more and more activity in between Asia, so between China and the rest of the Asian countries. We recently started to look at like Malaysia, uh, with mm -hmm. uh, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, those uh, um, countries we are looking at uh, some uh, investment opportunities there. Uh, but uh, by and large, we are still focused on China and uh, because as I said, right now we see Big, uh, tremendous of activity in the China market. I think uh, mm. some of the funds, the Chinese VC funds are out of capital or they, uh, so there are just a few players in the market and we see uh, literally like 20 or 30 percent more deals every month now compared to like a year ago. So currently we are very, very busy with uh, China focused uh, deals, but we try to help our portfolio companies to work with our, uh, to get into other Asian markets. But what's the next wave of technologies that you're seeing that China is now developing? Mm -hmm. Are you seeing mm -hmm. a new wave now of of technologies and business models which have happened as part of this this crisis? So I actually, I thought about it, like how do I describe what's post-COVID compared to like pre-COVID-19? And uh, I, uh, I basically summarized in three themes. I'm sure there are many more themes, but uh, I try to just convey what's on top of my mind when I think about what's post-COVID versus pre-COVID-19. And the first one is certainly, uh, I'm sure everybody who is based in China have heard about it and everybody is talking about it, is what's called Xin Zijian. And uh, that's uh, new infrastructure construction. And it came out basically as uh, industrial guidance for stim 
it's not a stimulus in a sense that it's tied to a specific amount of dollar, but that's what the government is promoting as uh, uh, in terms of uh, investing uh, state resources in building up the economy. So the new infrastructure construction uh, basically have five main focus areas. One is 5G, one is connected cars, one is a satellite and on the sea cable, one is cloud computing, and the other is industrial internet. So those are the five main focus areas for what's called the new infrastructure construction, so or NIC, what we short name it. And if you look at those areas, it uh, uh, basically it um, uh, is building up more IT infrastructure, and it's very much related to building more IT infrastructure. So instead of building the roads and more airports or physical infrastructure, the government is trying to build up more IT infrastructure, which I think makes great sense currently, because the more roads and physical infrastructure investment have now diminishing return on investment, as China is quite well developed in terms of physical infrastructure. So spending more money on the IT, in, in, uh, IT infrastructure has a higher return on capital uh, at this economic development stage of China. So I think it's a very good policy to uh, come out to say, uh, let's uh, push for new, new infrastructure development, but it's more related to building up the IT infrastructure. So it uh, aligns very well with our CM's investment focus. So. Uh, because a lot of the materials and advanced manufacturing goes into these, uh, these uh, new infrastructure spending. So that's one, one hot uh, word or hot phrase in China uh, after the COVID, post the COVID. And the next one is a zizu ke kong in Chinese. And it's really about autonomy and controllable. So translating to autonomy and controllable. And it's uh, basically a sense, I think the whole global world is getting the sense that uh, having uh, uh, basically too much dependence on another country is dangerous for the country itself. So China, um, especially since there was China-US trade war, so a lot of the technology is uh, 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 basically China realized it needs to develop its own technology. And so autonomy, and controllable becomes a very big topic in the China uh, landscape or today. And I want to say that it's not only China, I, I believe, that is going that route. Even when we look at the US startups uh, today, uh, quite a few of them are getting very strong support from the US government because the US government, the US society also believes that there's too much reliance on China for their manufacturing uh, supply chain. So getting more autonomy and controllable supply chain and technology in the country is becoming a trend, I think, I believe, globally. So it creates interesting opportunity in um, both in China and in the in US and Europe, I'm sure. So uh, because, for example, I just give you an example, we are looking at a PCB technology company based in the US. You would think that the PCB is so like uh, um, uh, so common now, right? So China makes the world's uh, has probably world's 90% of PCB manufacturing capacity, but the U.S. startup is trying to develop its next generation PCB technology because it wants to have autonomy and controllable and more advanced PCB technology within on the U.S. soil. So that's uh, uh, basically. Uh, that we wouldn't see before, like in, among the US startups. So I think I want to say it's not just the China phenomenon, but China is trying to do the same. Like uh, I think one of the participants said before, China is uh, lacking in semiconductor, in a lot of uh, uh, um, other IT technology. So there's a great sense of urgency in China to develop uh, the technologies that China still lacks. And then the third uh, difference that we, I think we see is a change is really about to be. So a lot of the innovation in China is known for, like uh, Andrew, what you were mentioning, are to see businesses. So China leads in, in terms of WeChat or uh, a lot of the 
uh, well-known public company uh, outside of China actually are to see business models because for a long time to be is not a very profitable business model in China uh, but now there's uh, uh, just a tremendous emphasis on to be uh, businesses uh, to uh, because a lot of the high-tech uh, business needs to be sell sold to another high business so it's to be so for us it's actually uh, uh, great because we have only invested in two B companies or, uh, uh, from our day one, so 2010 to uh, now. So in the last 10 years, we have been quite, uh, in the first five years, we have been quite lonely because most VC funds are focused on two C businesses and only now to B becomes more fashionable. And I think uh, post COVID-19, the two B is also going to be more and more fashionable. And if you look at the public exits, like listing on the Kotuan uh, Ban or the new listings, those are primary to be businesses. So it's a great time for the to be business uh, uh, to be businesses models. So because of that, uh, uh, those three factors, like that, those are just the top three that came up on my head, mind when I think about post COVID nineteen. Uh, what we have, uh, what to see from CM Venture Capital, what we are doing is to uh, really uh, take these trends and look at businesses A that is in the new infrastructure construction plan, B the, uh, the business that develop critical technology, or the first in China technology uh, that is uh, related to autonomy, uh, uh, technology autonomy. So critical technologies that uh, really fills a gap, not another better mousetrap, for example, or another uh, better product that may be better, but it's not that critical. And then the third point, we are really uh, adjusting to look at uh, capital efficient business models in among the to be businesses, because the to be business already has usually long like account receivable and uh, uh, cycle. Uh, it's not like a to see business where you just uh, get cash. So um, and in today's environment where the capital is not uh, uh, is uh, scarce than before, we are even more focused on capital efficient business models. So we are really adjusting our uh, investment uh, uh, strategy to say, OK, how do we invest in companies that will uh, be in high growth market that uh, brings the critical technology or the first uh, in China technology or first in US technology it, uh, in the case of autonomy and uh, looking for capital efficient business models. Yeah, I wouldn't uh, dare to say I know what the political leaders are thinking, but uh, uh, currently we don't see a very big, a huge uh, policy push, push towards, uh, towards the sustainability uh, issue. And uh, uh, I think uh, for the waste management, it's more out of uh, practical because, uh, for example, Shanghai and Beijing are running out of uh, waste uh, incineration plant. So they got to find a solution for waste management. And then we see a big investment from like uh, SOE into uh, clean energy in terms of like solar or uh, wind or those uh, I think will continue. Uh, in the uh, new energy or renewable, and then the push towards the hydrogen economy. But all those, I think, are more driven by the economic factor uh, uh, than by the, it, it economically makes sense. Of course, it does also society good, but uh, uh, if you look at uh, like hydrogen economy, there's a great uh, uh, business model or why China is, uh, should develop a hydrogen economy. It benefits so. If you look at the investment and the amount of GDP that uh, hydrogen economy can produce, it's uh, really a good return on investment. And uh, so I believe that the China policy making is a very sort of technocrat looking at uh, uh, what's the return on investment and what's the economic picture. Uh, certainly with the economy now slowing down, it's uh, I think the overall driving force is about how to develop the economy uh, uh, making more bang out of the buck for investment. So I, I wouldn't say think that the social or the environmental consideration is the number one factor right now uh, uh, for, for, for this period.
Uh, in terms of uh, the international collaboration, um, I certainly think that in the short term, uh, there will be a shock to this whole accelerating globalization before. So mm. up to now, we have always uh, been uh, more and more globalized. And I think this shock is uh, putting everybody more concerned about globalization. So in the short term, there will be, uh, I certainly think uh, I would be lying if I don't think, that I say that I think the international collaboration is going to be impacted in the short term mm. uh, uh, for by this uh, current uh, current situation. But I think uh, as an investor, what we need to do is to look at uh, any opportunity in any challenge, right? So mm -hmm. I feel like uh, in this autonomy and uh, uh, in this uh, period, you still have great investment opportunity, both uh, in China and uh, abroad because of this uh, situation. So mm -hmm. what, we, what we basically, what we do is to look at the situation and say, okay, how do we invest in this uh, current climate? Mid